Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and hello. My name is Shafika and I, along with Alida, will be representing group 7 and 8 in delivering a presentation on the ethical issues to be considered in genetic testing. So I'll be presenting the first half while Alida will be presenting the second half. So moving on to the first subtopic, what are the social, legal and ethical issues related to genetic testing? Well, we've listed six down here, which will be further elaborated on in future slides. So they are genetic discrimination, communicating test results, duty to disclose, informed consent, prenatal testing, and privacy and confidentiality. Moving on to our second subtopic, is genetic testing legal? In regards to the legislation of genetic testing, it is no surprise that the discovery of genetic information has provided us with the ability to obtain a lot of predictive information about the individuals being tested. For example, we're able to obtain information about their future health status, their future offspring, and even information about their biologically related family members. Unfortunately, along with this abundant information comes many legal implications, and therefore appropriate management of this information in clinical and research contexts is very important. Now, in order to minimise the harm directed towards the individuals being tested in terms of confidentiality as well as their own rights, a legal framework has been created to provide further protection to these patients. The World Medical Association's Declaration on Rights of the Patient includes right to confidentiality, right to information, right for genetic counselling, and right to freedom of choice. So to elaborate more on the rights of the patient, the first being the right to confidentiality, now the private information obtained from genetic testing can only be disclosed if the patients themselves have given their permission or if provided for in the law. Now, in terms of the family of the patients, healthcare providers are obligated to not disclose any information to the family without the permission of the patients. This, however, can be ignored if the circumstances are extreme. If the family members seem to be under high risk, then it is highly encouraged for the patients to discuss the information with their family to benefit both sides. The patient also has the right to information. The patient has every right to receive information about themselves in their medical records, and that includes their genetic test results. Therefore, it's very important that we explain this information in a way that they are able to understand. Genetic testing, despite it being able to provide us with a lot of information, still has its limits. Therefore, it's important that the patient understands the extent of this information. Genetic counselling is also a right of the patients. Genetic counselling is very important in helping the patients make decisions based on their own values and interests. And it should be noted that the personal values of the counsellor should not interfere with the decisions of the patients. Genetic counselling is usually encouraged in parents or couples planning a pregnancy or in those who are worried about passing a genetic disease onto their offspring. The patient also has the right to freedom of choice. The patient has every right to either agree to or deny having a genetic test performed on them. And if they have any knowledge of the risks that come with this, they should not be forced to act upon this knowledge. Despite this, however, there is a lot of societal pressure towards these patients to obtain further medical intervention for their own benefit. Now we'll talk about genetic discrimination and why it is an issue. What is genetic discrimination? It is discrimination against an individual or against members of that individual's family solely because of real or perceived differences from the normal genome in the genetic constitution of that individual. Notice that normal is placed in quotation marks because it is impossible to give a characterization of what constitutes a normal genome. For example, the denial of employment to an asymptomatic person who has the genotype for 
hemochromatosis is considered genetic discrimination, but the denial of employment to a person with the same genotype suffering from liver disease caused by that same genotype does not. Another example is the denial of insurance coverage to an individual whose non-inherited cancer had been long cured would not constitute genetic discrimination, but the denial of insurance to that individual's relatives because of the belief that that type of cancer is heritable would be considered genetic discrimination. So why is genetic discrimination an issue? Individuals at risk for genetic discrimination might encounter genetic discrimination in the course of dealing with any social institution that provides a benefit or a service. It is most likely to occur in two areas, which are employment and insurance. Employment discrimination includes unfavorable treatment in hiring, promotion, assignment of duties, discharge, compensation, and other terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. A well-known example of discrimination on the basis of a genetic condition occurred in the U.S. Air Force, which at one time they prohibited carriers of sickle cell disease from becoming pilots. Insurance companies might discriminate by denying life, health, or disability insurance to people on the basis of their genotypes because these individuals or members of their families may have a higher incidence of claims. To illustrate, I'll take an example of a case of a young woman whose parents is affected by Huntington disease. There's a 50% chance for her to develop the disease. So an insurance company might refuse to underwrite a life insurance policy unless she agreed to be tested for the disease and found to not have the Huntington disease gene. Now you might be wondering, is genetic information protected under law? First, we'll look at the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, GINA. It is signed into law on the 21st of May, 2008. The purpose of this law is to protect individuals from discrimination from insurers and employers allowing the individual to get medically beneficial genetic tests without fear of losing their insurance and their jobs. It also reassures participants of research studies that their DNA will not be used against them. So Title I, Health Insurance. Health insurers cannot use your genetic test results to deny your health coverage or set the price you pay for health insurance. It covers health plans, either big or small, from health insurance through employers to government-run insurance and individual health policies. Title II prohibits employment discrimination on the basis of genetic information, whereby employers cannot use your genetic test result to make hiring and salary decision or set other job-related policies. Employers are prohibited from requiring you to take a genetic test except in a very few cases to protect the employer's safety. Second, we'll look at the Personal Data Protection 1970. It protects information that is not provided by the individual solely for his or her personal purposes. The Act makes an exception on the condition that data protection is necessary for medical purposes and is taken by healthcare professionals. The third and last one is Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, HIPAA. Note that this is only in the US, while in Malaysia we're only protected by the personal data protection. Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act was enacted on the 21st of August 1996. It is to assure that the individual's health information is properly protected while allowing the flow of health information needed to provide and promote high quality health care and to protect the public, public's health and well-being. Who is covered by the privacy rule? It consists of four groups which are health, health plans, healthcare providers, healthcare clearing houses, and business associates. For health plans, individual and group plans that provide or pay the cost of medical care are covered entities. Health plans include health, dental, vision, and prescription drug insurers, Health Maintenance Organizations, HMO, Medicare, Medicaid, 
Medicare Plus Choice and Medicare Supplement Insurance and Long-Term Care Insurance. It also includes employer-sponsored group health plans, government and church-sponsored health plans, and multi-employer health plans. For healthcare providers, every healthcare provider, regardless of size, who electronically transmits health information in connection with certain transactions. These transactions include claims, benefit eligibility inquiries, referral authorization requests, or other transactions for which Department of Health and Human Services HHS, has established standards under the HIPAA transactions rule. Next, healthcare clearinghouses are entities that possess non-standard information they receive from another entity into a standard or vice versa. Lastly, business associates, a person or organization other than a member of a covered entity's workforce that performs certain functions or activities on behalf of or provides certain services to a covered entity that involves the use of disclosure of individually identifiable health information. This includes claims processing, data analysis, utilization review, and billing. What information is protected? Health information includes many common identifiers, for example, the individual's name, address, birth date, and social security number. And information including demographic data that relates to, first, the individual's past, present, or future physical or mental health or condition. Second, the provision of health care to the individual. And third, the past, present, or future payment for the provision of health care to the individual. These are the references used for this presentation. Thank you.